Thank you. You may be seated. It is a miracle. You stood up, and while we were singing, the room filled up. <laughs> a couple of small announcements before we begin. The first is that, especially because there has been some substituting of voting members from congregations, people who were registered originally have been replaced by others for a variety of reasons, the office staff has lost track of the emails of those substituted people, not all of them, but we neglected to get them all. This is only important if you want to receive the email updates that occur during the assembly. Samantha is sending out email updates. So if you want your, to receive those and you're not sure that you're on the list, but especially if you were substituted for somebody else at the last minute, you should send your email, you should send an email to news at socalsynod.org. See it up there on the screen? News at socalsynod.org. And it, it's, I don't think there's any danger in sending a message even if you are on the update list or you're just not sure. The worst thing that can happen is you'll get two. Thank you for that. Note the hashtags under which tweeting and Facebook posting can be done. I like to do that kind of thing, but I just don't have time at this. Um, also, I'd like to call on Pastor Stephanie Jager of St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in North Hollywood, which has provided through its deaf ministry our signers for this assembly to introduce them. I meant the one down there, but it's oh, fine. Sorry. No, no, stay. You're here. But no, use this one. No, use it. That's okay. Use oh, this. I one. Sorry. So sorry. Didn't mean to make you run up the stairs. My apologies. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, raise your hand if you knew that this synod is home to the only ELCA deaf ministry west of the Ozarks. Surprise! You are the supporters and beneficiaries and uh, beloved people of God together with Sharing Hands Ministry, the deaf ministry at St. Matt's. And we're very excited that this year all of our voting members from St. Matt's come from our deaf community and as a result we have signers with us and we are blessed today to once again have Hope Simon who is, the, uh, is currently signing and Antonio Goodwin um, who switches off uh, because as you can imagine talking with your hands can be exhausting. Um, so. Uh, anyway, thank you, and uh, we hope that you appreciate the embodiment of the gospel in the ASL signing. Thank you very much. I'm a visual person, so whenever there's signing happening, I can't take my eyes off of it. It's a, it's, it's a second way of listening, so I'm lucky I'm looking this direction. The... Um, I'd also like to introduce, bring forward to the microphone, our, my colleague and friend and our, uh, the leader of us, the synod next to ours, the Pacifica Synod, Bishop Andy Taylor, for a greeting from Pacifica. Good morning, Southwest California. It's uh, my pleasure to be here with you. I do bring you greetings from the Pacifica Synod. We are your neighbors to the east, to the south, and to the west. We have congregations in Barstow to the east, in Joshua Tree and Palm Desert. We have congregations uh, uh, to the south of you, from Whittier down to San Diego. And we have a few congregations to the west of you. I have the rough duty, I know you all pity me this, of going to Hawaii a couple of times of years. I know, to serve our uh, 10 congregations on the islands and, uh, and I bring you greetings from all of them, but not just from them. As a part of Region 2, I also bring you greetings from uh, the other synods of Region 2, from uh, Bishops uh, Mark Homerud, Deborah Hutterer, and uh, Jim Gonia of Sierra Pacifica, Grand Canyon, and Rocky Mountain Synod. We are church together in this region. We do a variety of things together in this region. We, uh, we work um, cooperatively as a region in first call theological education for those deacons and pastors who are in their first three years. We help them to gain in skills, but also just to have a safe place to share their experiences and meet with colleagues and figure out what's going on as they figure out ministry together. We uh, gathered deacons together and our newest roster members in January, and we're going to continue to do that. And just this last Wednesday, our three California synods met up in Sacramento for Lutheran Lobby Day. Over 80 uh, Lutherans from... 
Yeah. From Sierra Pacific, Southwest California, and, um, and Pacifica gathered in Sacramento to meet with staffs of our state senators and representatives to talk about how we can help our neighbors in their need and uh, what our legislative priorities are for clean water and lifting children out of poverty and providing health care for all. So I want to um, acknowledge our work as church together there. But particularly, we have a close relationship, Pacifica and Southwest California. We do a lot together. Together, we uh, support our camps, Lutheran retreats, camps, and conferences. Camp El Camino Pines in your territory in Fraser Park, and Camp Luther Glen in our territory in the Ukaipa um, Oak Glen area. Together, uh, we uh, support the work of Lutheran Social Services of Southern California. I hope to see many of you at the Dodger game on January 22nd. I, of course, will be wearing my Padres gear, <laughs> even though they're not playing. But I know that uh, uh, um, Bishop Irwin will be wearing his uh, Dodgers gear at that. And, <laughs> and I understand there are still tickets available for that. Together we support the Oasis, our professional leaders conference, gathering pastors and deacons and church lay leaders uh, together for a time of, um, uh, of uh, education and fellowship and, and uh, sharing with one another. That's coming up in October and uh, there will be more information about that coming out very, very shortly. We join together for a variety of reasons, but I'm here to give you um, not only the greetings of Pacifica, to give you their thanks. Thank you for being collaborative and supportive. Thank you, Bishop Irwin, for the ways that your staff and ours work together to uh, help support uh, the ministries that we do together. Thank you for the many ways that we share the gospel of Jesus Christ with our neighbors in the world. What you do makes a difference, and for that we are very, very thankful. So thank you, and it's my pleasure to be with you here this day. And I understand there's a video about the Oasis is to be queued up at this time. Thank you. Bishop Andy is welcome to wear his Padres gear, especially since we're playing the Rockies. Now I'd like to call on the CEO of Lutheran Social Services in Southern California, Ron Drews, to give a brief greeting from LSS. I have to be in my best behavior because two of our three members are sitting, well, I guess Bishop Taylor left the stage, but sitting in the room. So this will be uh, nothing but good words about their membership and how they control our board of directors. And, but in all seriousness, it's a real affiliation that makes uh, our affiliation with the ELCA and with the synods uh, very strong. We have a number of things going on, um, and it would take me a long time to go through them all, but I want to just uh, highlight a few things that are at our table so that you'll come and get more information. The first thing is that we have what's called a gathering of friends. We have a little brochure that you can pick up a flyer that tells you about how you can uh, engage Lutheran Social Services on on a community level, and that's, that's the tease at that point. Another is our, our quarterly or monthly newsletter. I think what we're gonna do, we have a sign-up sheet there if you want to uh, tell us how many you would like on a quarterly basis, but I think we'll just start sending it out in a small amount, and each one has an envelope that you can send back to us and say, great, send 10 more than what you have been sending, or don't send them at all. We, don't need them or whatever the case, rather than trying to get everybody to sign them up. So check that out. Another is called Bridges of Hope. It's a new program that we're starting to help women with 
children. Uh, it's a direct, and you'll read through this, that the title is Churches Respond, Homelessness Ends, and Hope Begins. We're connecting with that organization. Some of you may have heard of that. There have been churches in the past that have been a part of that, Well, we're kicking that off in a larger way. We're looking for angels. You'll get this attractive pin if you join. It's a, it's a connection, it's a liaison from your church community and then uh, giving us that information and vice versa so we can create that kind of linkage between uh, all of Southern California and LSS. The last, or one of the last is a card and we have all of our information. We call it the what, where, why, who, and whatever the last word is, um, so that you can give this to someone who says, I've heard of LSS, but what is it? Or I'd like to help, how can I? Or there's a homeless guy at the street, and we have, I know we're close to an LSS, so don't give this to someone in Templeton, because that might not make sense. But give it to someone that you know, and they have all of our addresses all in this handy dandy, folded over to the size of a business card. I'd like to end with one last thing. Take this brochure if you take nothing else. What we do for a living, two principal things. We work with children and we work with the homeless. And the homeless in terms of emotional and mental illness and all the other things, sobriety, et cetera, that come along with it. It's logical to think that if you have a home, you're probably not going to be homeless. Makes sense. We are the only HUD accredited certified program for housing counseling. It has started to work very well for us. What we're doing is using, making available that same service to the churches in Southern California. It may not be the best fit, but in my humble opinion, it gives people options and choices in terms of the housing that they're in or want to be in or need to get out of or whatever the situation is. So we're taking what we've learned from and experienced at working with the homeless. And if you can find homes or housing for homeless people, probably you can find a home in Southern California that someone can afford who is a first time home buyer or the reverse. So that's the tickler with this one. I want to end with saying thank you for all the support. Look at our banner that I put up in our booth, find your name. When you see all of the people that last year, all the churches that gave support to LSS, you can appreciate the humbleness and the thank you coming today. We would not be, we cannot be anything without the church support. So thank you very, very much. Last, they already did my Dodger commercial, but I, I told Crystal I was gonna end with that. So please buy tickets. We have a 10% discount up until we extend, we didn't extend, the Dodgers extended it until Monday. So we can you know, buy the tickets now, you get 10% off. Thank you very much, Bishop. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. We look forward to seeing you at Dodger Stadium. If you are, have ever been a volunteer or a donor to Lutheran Social Services, please raise your hand. Wonderful, almost everybody in the room has a connection. This is an important ministry for us and we're grateful for it every day. It makes a difference in the lives of many in our neighborhoods. So I'd like to call business session three to order and ask the Senate Secretary for a credentials report. Reverend Chair, as of 9 a.m., there were 79 ministers of word and sacrament present, which is 27% of the voting members, 218 laity, which represents 73% of the voting members. There were three deacons, 19 synod council members, and 196 congregational lay voting members for a total voting member strength of 297. Of those, 148 are male, or 50%, 149 or 50% are female. There are 70 persons of color or whose first language is other than English, which is 24% of our voting strength. And there are 22 voting members under the age of 30, which is 7%. 
There are also 69 visitors for a total attendance of 366. Reverend Chair, I present the credentials report and move its adoption. Thank you. So we will do a vote again this time with the voting cards, just so you have a little warning to get them out. Is, yes, discussion. Yes. Oh, yes, I have a discussion point. So it's related to the credentials report. And first I wanted to thank the Synod Council for waiving the fees for youth and young adult members this time. Can we get an applause for that? However, we still only have 22 youth and young adult members here. So once again, I want to challenge you all to think about how we can increase that number going forward. And I also want to remind you that today is a school day, and that is a reason why some of those people are not here. Um, I also want to give you something actionable. And one way you can show your support for our youth and young adult members is to join Pastor Steve Jerby for his workshop this afternoon. In, on community organizing training for youth and young adults so that you can have an understanding of uh, what the young people are going to do when we start organizing in our churches and communities. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let me just add to that before we vote that one of the reasons we have repeated credentials reports is that they continue to change as more people arrive and so we will see progress in all these numbers going forward. Is there any other discussion of the credentials report? Yes. Are you coming to the microphone? Yes. No. Okay. Sorry. Um, all right, then. If we're ready for a vote, if you uh, favor the adoption of the credentials report, please raise your green card. If you oppose the report, raise your red card. And if you wish to abstain from this vote, raise your white card. Thank you. The, the credentials report is adopted. So now I'd like to turn the chair over, back over, to Pastor Rafael Malpica Padilla. For those of you who weren't here with us last night, he is our churchwide representative and the director of the Global Mission Unit in the churchwide organization. He is with us to conduct the bishop election, and, uh, and we're grateful for his presence with us. He's also a Bible study leader and he gave the churchwide report last night, so we're working him pretty hard. He's a man of many hats. He's also known for wearing a snappy hat to most occasions. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Raphael. Good morning. The uh, report of the uh, first ballot for bishop is as follows. Uh, you will see in a minute uh, the, uh, the whole report. Um, there are several people with uh, one, two, three votes. Uh, I will not read those. You will be able to see those in the screen. Uh, I will uh, share with you um, the uh, results uh, from that election. Um, as I look at uh, what the uh, election committee prepared, there are um, a piece of information that is missing that I, I need to share with you, um, and I need to work with the office. Um, but um, the result of the uh, ballot is that there is no election on this first ballot. So we will be going to a second ballot. The information that was not included in the report that I need to share with you for the sake of transparency is the number of ballot, legal ballot cast that will determine the number of ballots needed for election. So that's the information that I need to, to share with you. So don't trust the numbers that I give you so you will be able to see it for yourself. Uh, the uh, top four uh, ballot uh, people that receive uh, uh, the highest number of votes are as follows. Pastor L.B. Tatum, 13 votes. Pastor Sheldon Hess, 14 votes. 
Reverend Dr. Pamela Charlie's 32 votes, and Bishop R. Guy Irwin, 164 votes. I believe, and I'm working for, from memory, that the number of votes needed for election was 190 votes, 190 votes. But I will be sharing that information. And uh, can we get someone to project the, uh, we need to see the uh, names of uh, all people in the ballot uh, because you have until 11 o'clock today. Oh, here we are. So you will be looking at that list, and if your name is there, and you do not want to continue in this call process, you should go to the Synod office and fill a form to remove your name from the ballot. You have until 11 o'clock today or 10.55 uh, to do that because at 11 o'clock we will have the second ballot for bishop. All those names uh, that are not removed from the ballot will, be, will move forward to the next ballot. Any questions? And as soon as the information comes from the Synod office, I will give you the total number of ballot cast and the number needed for election. Thank you for that report. The, um, I also want to repeat what we said yesterday that because of needing to have an exact number of voting members for each ballot, we will close voting member registration for latecomers a half an hour before the ballot and we will open it again after the second ballot. Just so you know, there will be a time in which it will not be possible to register as a, vote, as a new voting member arriving on the site. I think we should have another song. I feel like singing. And I don't want to do it alone. <laughs> so stand up, please, and stretch a little bit. Let the coffee get to every extremity. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, O God, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. We're going to sing a song about the L word that's in our ELW. Yezu, Yezu, fill us with your love, 708, if you have the red book with you. Otherwise, it'll be on the wall shortly. And we'll sing them all. Let's sing all. This, this anchor hymn in our book comes to us uh, from the African continent and the country of Ghana. So let's sing all uh, four stanzas.
Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor Jim and Barbara. Uh, Pastor Raphael will now give a little update to his report. Total number of legal ballot cast, 266. 199 needed for election. L.B. Tatum, 13. Sheldon Hess, 14. Pamela Charlie, 32. Guy Irwin, 164. There is no election. We will proceed later on to the second ballot. Thank you. One of the great joys of filling this office is the work that I get to do with volunteers in the Synod. And the principal relationships are, of course, with the officers of the Synod, but especially with the Vice President. Randy Foster has been Vice President of this Synod for five years now, and this is his final year. Next year we will elect a successor. I can imagine no better partner in this ministry than Randall Foster. He has been incredibly generous with his time and with his love, and I'm grateful for that. It actually ch chokes me up a little bit. Uh, there, I know all the other synod bishops in the ELCA, and I know many of their vice presidents too, and I don't know any who work together more closely or better than Randy and I. And that is such a blessing in this work. You have a layperson at the, and the, the chief, the principal lay elected office of this synod who is constantly working on your behalf. He spends at least part of one day every week in the office meeting with me and catching up with what's going on. So I would like to introduce him now to give the vice president's report. Randy. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, living in the South Bay, I have to tell you, I have finally managed to figure out what it requires to navigate the 110 to Glendale without encountering most of the downtown traffic. Uh, but I tell you, it's, a, gl it's a, a glimmer of hope because there's only about 12 minutes. And if I could reach a certain part of the 110 right around the um, uh, sound, uh, right around Vernon. If I can get there at a certain time of the day, I know my travels have been blissfully arranged. If I miss it by five minutes, I'm calling Bishop by our phone and saying our 11 o'clock meeting is slightly delayed. Not only do we have the opportunity, frankly, to meet every week, but I have found it an immense blessing to travel on your behalf to each of your conferences, the fall and spring conferences, to be and to see the body of our Lord Jesus Christ in the embodiment of our congregations and congregants throughout the Southwest California Senate. I can't think of a better blessing personally to have had that experience. You know, you must, you must know that each of your settings is uniquely different. Absolutely marked by God in a unique way. And I've had the pleasure and the benefit of sitting in many of your congregations and witnessing that. And for that, I say thanks be to God for all that he does in and through you. In your package, you will find the report of the Senate Council as offered by the Vice President. If you tag into the staff reports, you will find that in guidebook. This is an executive summary. It's a distillation of the work, the challenges, the triumphs, and certainly the struggles that the Council has been engaged in and how they have dedicated their time and treasures and certainly their talent to the life of our mutual ministry together. 
For as you know, we are clearly in a state of mutual ministry. There is an interconnectedness. There is great synergy between what we are and who we are in what we do. Most importantly, it is anchored by our ability to know that we are charged with the great commandment to go and tell. As part of the fall conference, Bishop provided a new paradigm for establishing dedicated funds that could be used by the Senate to enable it to address financial shortcomings that might exist in our congregational families. We called that Church Together Generously. It was a campaign for a broader mutual ministry within the Senate. And frankly, it was at the heart of our central theme, We Are Church Together, for 2019. It's the same philanthropic program that was presented to you last year as a conceptualization for which you expressed great interest that we should proceed with. You even allowed the offerings from our Senate Assembly last year to be the initial seed money for this philanthropic program. Well, what's the program supposed to do? Why have a philanthropic program? Your Senate Council and your Senate Treasurer spoke about the idea that mission support, why it is a stable resource for our mutual ministry, it equally is challenged. We've had congregations that we have lost in the process. Having moved from 124 in 2014 to 113 in 2019. Everyone has been integral in their mission support. They have been generous, but the number of congregations continues to dwindle. And then there are the congregants. It was mentioned today that we have 22 youth representatives here. I recognize that there are congregations where there may not be a youth person at all, or very few. It is a issue that not only our church is addressing, but every mainline church in America is addressing. There used to be sanctity to Sunday morning, but there are a number of issues and opportunities that distract people from Sunday worship. Which is why some congregations, frankly, are going to Saturday, they're going to weekdays, they're looking at other ways of addressing worship time together. In our philanthropic efforts, we are hoping that resources that we generate that will complement mission support will address equipping and supporting our leaders, both clergy and lay, establishing and supporting new ministries and mission congregations, of which we were able to foster several in the last couple of years, assisting the revitalization of our congregations, finding ways to re-nurture, rekindle those congregations in such a fashion that they are blooming with young people. They are blossoming with people who are anxious to know about the Lord. And then certainly we have to find ways of supporting our social justice responsibilities. Every year, several of us go down to Skid Row. And every year, we walk away realizing that everything we brought, all of the packages of support that we brought in vans, All of that is a drop in the bucket to the needs that are in that area. 
We have stood in line for two hours issuing out packages of support, only to find two hours later the line continues to extend itself. Why? Because a person walking down the street with a hygiene kit that re represents $11 of personal products that they can use passes someone who doesn't have one, and before you know it, they're in that line. We took some young people to Skid Row, 14, 15 years old, and they were handing out these kits. They were okay until they saw young people, 14, 15 years old, receiving the kits. They cried afterwards. How could this happen? Why did it happen? Why am I so fortunate not to be in this line? Where is my God in all of this? The only way we can combat these concerns is to pool our resources like in the Macedonia church and make a wholesale difference in the lives of people, one person at a time. I'm reminded of the program that's at Mount Olive never knew that college students were homeless. Never had an appreciation that people could be in class attempting to learn and, and edify themselves in the most significant way, and they are challenged by whether they had breakfast, whether there's a lunch coming and it's imminent, and more importantly, where are they gonna sleep tonight? And then to go see that program and to recognize that we have churches who are, are embodying themselves to make a difference in the lives of those students, one student at a time, said that we as a collective body, we as the church, are doing what we are charged to do. There are examples, many of them, that I'd like to highlight, and I'll be quick. We have five congregations that are ethnically diverse. And they try to do something about this homeless concern. But when they start their lines and start issuing out food, invariably the line is extended far longer than the food that they have to offer. Their challenge is this, though. They have to ask themselves, will we feed the people who are coming next week, or will we keep the lights on in the sanctuary? The need in these communities is so vast and the resources so limited that is your way to help them through the support that you offer. And we ask that you consider that most, so most significantly. We are only church together when a congregation that struggles is supported by all of our congregations because it's an opportunity for us to serve. I have seen our Senate intervene on behalf of clergy who received letters from Portico saying, your payment has not been made. The congregation is unable to pay your benefits. We intercede and have circumvented that lapse in service. It's not isolated. Unfortunately, it has happened all too frequently. And then there are the newly established communities of faith. One of them is here, the Lord of Life, sponsored by the students at Cal Lutheran. It's a sacramental ministry. It is held up in the highest regard I wish I had that when I was at San Fernando Valley State. If you're wondering where that was, that's Cal State Northridge. <laughs> I'm dating myself. It would have been phenomenal to have had the ability to sit in worship with my student colleagues on the campus of education for which I was residing to help me 
between my classes. It would have been phenomenal. We have that here. I think that re requires an applause on your university's behalf. <laughs> Our center equally has new ministries that are emerging in neighborhoods that uh, represent the clergy for whom they are, uh, those clergy for whom they are serving. It's interesting that we had six or seven new pastors installed, all of them serving diverse communities. That's unique in the ELCA. If we were in the Midwest, I would say that that is probably atypical. It is not by accident that the National Church looks to the Southwest California Senate for these kinds of examples. The how-to. How did you engage them in the pursuit of seminary education? How did you support them? How do you support them now in their first call? How do you support them in mission congregations that might not have the fiscal wherefore-all to even pay their salaries? How do you empower them over time? How do you align them with mentors who've been in service for 15, 20, 30, 40, 60 years? And if you look in our program, anyone who's been in service for over 20 years is recognized. I'd like to recognize them now and ask them to stand because they are the anchor, the foundation of our Senate. They are who we rely on and they are the ones for whom our Lord has entrusted. Please, if you have been in service for 20 years or more, please indulge me by just standing so we might say thank you. And then there are those congregations that are revitalizing themselves. It was mentioned yesterday that the catalyst for revitalization, the person for whom that task is, is charged, and frankly, who sits at the helm of that initiative, our own Pastor Marge, has had a number of congregations in the process of living the resurrection, becoming anew recrafting and re remodeling themselves in ways for which only the Holy Spirit understands and knows. I often wake up every morning and I say, Lord, I am reading the chapter that you wrote when I was born. And then I conclude by saying, I know that chapter has been blessed because the good Lord does what makes no mess. And so that allows me to walk into each day realizing that whatever the challenge is, whatever the obstacle might be, whatever the circumstances that I might face, the resolve has already been taken care of. Our congregations, those that are revitalizing themselves, are doing the exact same thing. They are realizing and recognizing that the chapter for them, the new chapter that's in front of them, has already been written. They are simply reading it and acknowledging the authorship of the Lord Almighty. Why, it's certainly true that our Senate intercedes in all of these situations. It equally intercedes as a church for the, for the sake of the world. And it clearly it is also by, not by accident that we have ministry support and partnerships in El Salvador Hong Kong, and one that we are currently crafting in Helsinki. Helsinki is a new one, and you can attribute that to bishops, initiatives, and being able to go there and foster this relationship. Making a difference requires your energy, requires your resources, requires your perseverance, requires your solidarity. 
I suspect we are making a difference in many ways. But I would also submit to you that the challenges that your Senate Council and you as a governing body continue to escalate. When we have Lutheran pastors separated from their families and sent to other, other countries, I think that's a problem. Especially when the mantra for moving people away from this country was initially predicated on what? Their, the degree by which they have infringed on our justice system by doing something that was untoward. I don't know anything that's untoward about ministry. And to have been snatched from your family and allow your children to stay and you removed, I, I, that's unconscionable. But these are the kinds of things that we have to deal with. These are the kinds of things that we must deal with. It was mentioned that the Episcopal Diocese and the Catholic Archdiocese of Los Angeles is working succinctly with the Southwest California Senate in, in these areas of addressing the separation of children from parents at our borders. That should not be collateral damage, but it is. Our alignment with the loss, the left out, the challenge, those in transition, those who cry out to Almighty God, that is what we do. That is frankly who we are. I believe this is why we have God's hands, God's work, and we're doing it in our hands. I believe this is why we are church together. And I submit to you that's not a shallow statement. It is not without substance, but it is substantive and it is spiritual. I hope you will join us as we write a new chapter in the life of our Senate, as we attempt to expand and, and, and advance our ministries together, as we look at ways in which we might bring to the storehouse our first fruits in addressing the multiplicity of concerns that we face, and as we recognize that we are clearly rich in the Lord and that our gifts will multiply. And through all of this, we look to God's grace and mercy, for together we are indeed church. We are the church, and we are the church together. May God bless each and every one of you. Thank you very much, Vice President Foster. One of the things that I always think about after Synod Assembly is what we could have done that we didn't do. And one of the things that I thought last year after our assembly was we didn't play enough and we didn't dance enough. So we have a little playing and dancing in this assembly scheduled in. Let's start with the playing. In a playful way, but one that is very fundamentally important to our vitality as congregations, Pastor Marge Funk Peel has been working with programs to encourage congregational vitality. And I want to introduce her now to help us play a little game together. Okay, so this game starts with a pop quiz. Okay. When, Jesus, when the lawyer asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment, he said what? <laughs> I think I heard most of the words. Okay. And then when Jesus, after he washed the feet, he gave them a new commandment, which was? Right. And all you need is? Right. And Tina Turner asked? And that is the best question. What does love have, what's love got to do with it? I wish I could sing like Tina Turner and do that, but that probably wouldn't be appropriate. Um, what does love have to do with it? Well, how about the possibility that love is the key to vitality? That whether you're talking about your one on, your personal relationship with God, 
Loving God, loving one another, loving neighbor is the key to that. And the congregation's vitality is keyed on its ability, its capacity for loving God, loving one another, and loving neighbor. Most, most of our congregations could use a little strengthening in that. We all do all three of those. We all love all three of those. But we need to strengthen our capacity to do that. And strengthening your capacity starts with the first question. It's a change model. It starts with the very first question. So everybody should have a little pack of cards on their table. Uh-oh, mine lost its dice. Oh, oh well. I'll pretend. So, the directions are here in this little lovely book. I want you to shuffle the cards first, mostly because I'm hoping you won't notice that what Bishop graciously called a typo, because otherwise it implies I don't know how to spell. Which, I like typo better, just saying. So shuffle the cards. Okay. We were sort of putting them like every five, four or five people. So this is going to be a group conversation. If you have the dice, you roll the die. The questions are by color. So the, if you get a blue die, you just take the first um, question off the top of the deck. If you get pink, you just take the bottom question. But everything else is color coded. You'll see the words Southwest California, God's work, our hands are in different colors. There's purple, red, green, and yellow, okay? If you're a little paying attention, a little savvy, you might notice that those colors mean something about relationships. So the red ones are about loving God. The purple ones are about loving one another. The green ones are about loving neighbor. And the yellow ones are kind of a general attitude kind of question. So are you guys ready? Okay, so everybody will roll, everybody has a die, roll it, and pick the question that has to do with that color. And here's the deal, then you just turn and chat with whoever you're with, and that's your question. If you don't like that question, roll again. Pick a new question. Okay, so we'll do that for about five minutes. I don't know what happened to my side. One more minute.
Okay, so do you like this game? Okay, yay! <laughs> I'm really sorry if you ended up having to talk to your pastor. I was really going to try to figure out how to make the pastors talk to each other, but it didn't quite work that way. Hopefully they're not too scary. Anyway, we might play this again later on in the day, and you can uh, eat... Leave the cards on the table for this assembly, but when you go, each congregation, please take a deck. Oh, and there are some Spanish language cards. I know that Maria was passing them out um, for congregations who that would be helpful to have them in Spanish. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Pastor March. We will return to this exercise and other conversation about congregational vitality intermittently through the assembly. Another person I'd like to recognize right now briefly is Karen Moyer, who is the chair of our lay leadership mission team. Many of you know her. She's been active in the Synod for many years and held many offices. I want to point her out today because she is taking photographs for us. And so she, if she points her camera in your direction, Please smile and don't look away. She's very unobtrusive, so, I'm, uh, so you might not even notice, but she is recording this, and you will see posts on Facebook about the assembly. So I would like now to introduce the chair of the Reference and Council Committee, Dr. Cecilia Travick Jackson, who will come forward for our first session of Reference and Council reports. We're considering three resolutions that were brought to the assembly beforehand and have gone through the Reference and Council Committee and they're in your materials. They're numbered one, two, and three. We're going to be considering them, each one in, one in a different session, and we're doing them in reverse order because number one has the greatest budgetary impact. We're putting it to the end because it'll be closer to the budget. So we're starting with resolution number three. Thank you. Resolution number three, be it resolved that the Southwest California Senate, I want to introduce the committee, sorry I didn't do that. Okay. Um, we, I would like to introduce our committee. And our committee members are, I'm Cecilia Travick Jackson, I'm the chair, Reverend Ron, Ronald Cox. And if you're here, will you please stand? Um, Attorney Stephen Ensberg, Deacon Agnes McLean, Marilyn Firstman, Julie Jensen, and Donna Pugh. And I'd like to thank the members for volunteering to serve on this committee. Now back to resolution three. Be it resolved that the Southwest California Senate encourage its congregations and members to support and advocate, advocate for universal access to comprehensive, affordable, high quality health care through a single payer national health program, including single payer legislation at the state level. Thank you very much. Let me give a little introduction to how we will do the discussion. I'll ask for a proponent of, or a sponsor of the resolution to come to a microphone to begin the conversation. We'll alternate between speakers for and opposed. Please bring a, one of your voting cards with you. If you're speaking in favor of the resolution, please bring a green card. And if you're uh, speaking in opposition, bring a red card, please, so that I can see who is who, and we'll alternate between the two. If there are only speakers on one side, or if uh, it seems like a lull, I'll end the debate at an appropriate time. We have a set period of time for this. Speeches are three minutes long, and there is a timer on the, uh, that's projected on the wall for those who are speaking so they can see. So is someone, one of the sponsors of this resolution, or someone who wishes to speak in favor of it, willing to come to a microphone?
I'm not seeing a lot of motion. Oh, here we go. Excellent. Thank you. Please uh, state your name and congregation. Jane Afonso, First Lutheran in Torrance. Okay, so Bob McDuff is responsible for this um, resolution, so we thank him. He's a member of our justice team, and the justice team supports this resolution. It's our moral and religious imperative to improve health care for everyone, regardless of income, status, or geography. We can't look the other way just because someone gets sick. Even if you think you have good insurance, you may be paying too much, getting too little, and be only one diagnosis away from potential bankruptcy. This um, resolution is calling for improved Medicare. If we can eliminate the huge administrative costs and the for-profit companies, we can improve accessibility and care better than Medi-Cal and Medicare. So you probably may not have read all the whereases in the resolution, but I'm going to sum them up very quickly. Almost 30 million Americans lack health care. We rank last in affordability and highest in infant mortality compared to 10 other high-income countries. We spend almost $4 trillion on health care, close to one-fifth of our gross domestic product, twice as much as the average per capita of other wealthy nations, and almost two-thirds of bankruptcies are partially due to illness or medical benefits. Administrative costs are 31% of our medical costs. Um, the ELCA uh, health care social statement um, has lots of great quotes that talk about taking profit out of our health care. We recommend our mutual responsibilities and guard against the ways in which motivation to maximize profit and to market health care like a commodity jeopardizes health and the quality of health care for all. And I'll end with a quote from Martin Luther King. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. I urge you to follow the words we heard yesterday um, that um, Raphael, oh gosh, I forget your name, Malpico Padilla mentioned about rage, and it's actually time for us to become reckless in our rage and follow the ways of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a card on the other side? Thank you. Please hold your applause for the discussion. Thank you. The other microphone. Jim Stoker, uh, Lutheran Church in the Foothills. I would just like to say that we have tried something very similar with the Affordable Care Act, and we found out one important lesson over the years since that, namely that the devil is in the details. And so what I'm suggesting is that it may not be appropriate to ask our churches to support a plan which hasn't been fleshed out and which may not benefit anybody. That's my thought on the subject. Thank you. Microphone West. I'm Marcia Harris. I'm the pastor at Central Lutheran Church in Van Nuys, a poverty church in our, Congre our synod. I'm also the spouse of the person who authored this particular petition. Um, with respect to health care for all, Affordable Care Act did not take for-profit out of the equation. In 2003, our national church adopted by a two-thirds majority vote a social statement called Caring for Health, Our Shared Endeavor. It outlines the crisis in health care, which has not been fully addressed by the Affordable Care Act, in part because it left the for-profit money of the root of all evils in the bottom of the motivations for people providing health care. More importantly, we are called to care for our neighbors. We Lutherans no longer as a faith body have a host of hospitals and care facilities to care for others in pain or in sickness as we once did. We have not, as people of faith, consistently stepped in to fill the gap that followed our exit. Thus, we Christians who call ourselves Lutherans have abdicated care for the poor, the orphan, the foreigner in our midst, and as Matthew 25 says, our Lord in our midst to our government. Luther would not be happy, but more importantly, our Lord God is disappointed. We have accepted an economic of profit over an economics for caring for others. We have given a place at the table to the powers of the world instead of being the hands and feet and heart of God and creating a kingdom of God economy 
and caring network in this world to overcome the darkness so that we can give glory and witness to God's partnership with humanity. This is our call, witnessing God's partnership with humanity through medicine, even as we also exercise our prayer bond with the Holy Spirit to seek healing and relief of pain through spiritual means. We are the faithful people who set up our intent in 2003, so now the time has come for us to not just intend, but to advocate a kingdom economy that gives everyone access to not our current Medicare system, but an enhanced system that offers more doctors, more services, comprehensive, affordable, high quality, single payer, because the profit motive for healthcare is not serving our call to care for everyone, especially the least of these. And when the Affordable Care Act was passed, all of those motivations were given over so that our for-profit companies could continue to operate without creating a kingdom economy, but leaving the current economy of this world in place to deal with health care. And I just absolutely think that this is our time to advocate, and the details do need to be worked out without so much giving away of the kingdom of God. Thank you. Microphone East. My name is Sam Fetchenbach. I'm with Trinity Lutheran Church in San Gabriel. Okay, I happen to be a cancer survivor. I am very, very thankful to our technically excellent healthcare system that was able to get the cancer out of my body and I am cured. However, I believe that we do have technically the best healthcare system in the world. We've got the cancer research, we've got the cardiac research, we've got the orthopedic research, we've got all of that stuff happening. I get upset with politics and partisan bickering because we really should be able to do much better than what we're doing. And we should be able to provide health care for all. I don't, I, I'm just someone that goes against, I, I've been to DMV. I don't think the government can do anything correctly. And I believe that we need to move more towards some private way. I kind of like the Israeli system where it's a controlled, but it's still private companies. I believe the profit does drive the innovation, which is why even though I'm cancer free, the, the equipment that they use to make me cancer free is now even more advanced to the next generation, so the next generation can become cancer free. And I believe we need to continue to drive the innovation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Green card, thank you. Good. Uh, Ralph Mittling from All Saints in Sun Valley. Uh, just some personal uh, experience. My wife had to go in for a series of treatments a couple years ago, and we were assured when she went in that they had authorization from the insurance company, only to receive a bill for $172,000. Mm. That came as a total surprise. Mm -hmm. It has been two years of fighting uh, it is now down to 3000 something, so we're getting close. Um, but again, how much that cost and the time it took and the frustration and the anguish uh, is just unbelievable. My daughter moved to Ireland a while back. She worked in a bookstore. She had to go to the doctor. She went. She got excellent care. And there's no billing. There's no administration. It's just amazing. So yeah, the, the plan isn't worked out, um, but there is a way to do it, and we need to work to find that way. Thank you. Is that right? Yes, thank you. Microphone East. Hi, my name is Stephanie Zong, and I'm a lay person, and my fr um, this is my first assembly <laughs> from Bethel and Sino. Woohoo! And. Uh, so what I wanted to say about this resolution is that I fully support, as a Christian, the first half of this. And I believe that is our work as Christians to encourage our congregants to advocate for universal health care for all and quality health care for all. The part that I struggle with is that we're proposing a specific solution without being necessarily experts in the health care system to be able to afford that. Um, there's two single-payer systems in the world that I have personal experience with. One is in Canada and one is in Taiwan. And my Canadian family, they get quality health care in Canada. Um, I was living in Taiwan for two years in my mid-20s and I went through the health care center. There's a lot of mismanagement there. So I think that just thinking about the universal of single-payer while in spirit sounds good. I think we really do 
I would caution us moving towards having people focus in on a policy that has to be contextually relevant within our system and our transition to truly make the first part real. And if there was a possibility of a resolution that supports just the first half, I would overwhelmingly support that. Thank you. Are there any more wishing to? Yes, got one here. What color is your card? Okay. Green, thank you. Okay. I want to echo Pastor Marsha on the spiritual concerns, on the practical concerns. We are basically in a system where people are covered by their employer. And that's not fair to the millions of people who are not insured. Um, what about the fact that many people have part-time jobs and are, the hours are cut so that they won't be eligible for benefits? What about the people who are not able to work? It also creates an un unfair burden on employers who might want to offer people jobs but they can't because they can't afford insurance costs. So th those are, I know it's not perfect, but those are the reasons that I'm in favor of a single payer system. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak to this resolution? I don't see anyone heading for a microphone. So we will proceed to a vote. But first, I'd like to call on Pastor Greg Kinsey, Dean of the Central Coast Conference, to offer a prayer before the vote. Please come forward and uh, stand on the embarrassingly high stage in the middle. I wanted you to see his shirt. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your care for us and for all people. We thank you for the uh, comments and sharing that has uh, been taking place about this resolution. Give us wisdom and insight as we now uh, come to a time of voting. Help us to hear your voice and to uh, be attentive to your will. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Greg. Uh, this again will be a voting card vote. Someone asked me this morning, when will we start using the voting machines? Well, we will. We'll have plenty of voting with those, but they require a bit of a tutorial before we start. So we've postponed that until the second session today in order to do the tutorial just before we need to start using them. And from that point on, we will use the voting machines. But right now, we're still with the car. Yes. Sorry. Yes. I, I know I got up here late, but I would like to propose an amendment to the resolution. I've already closed debate, and we've had our prayer. I'm sorry you're out of order. Thank you, Honor. The, um, so we'll proceed to the vote on the resolution as presented. It requires a majority for adoption. I will ask those who favor the adoption of this resolution to indicate with a green card. Those who oppose it with a red card. Thank you. Those who wish to abstain with a white card. It seems to me that a clear majority had voted for adoption. So I will declare the resolution adopted. Thank you very much. No, thank you very, very much. We'll see you later. The next time. Mr. Secretary, would you do your announcement? We have an announcement from the Secretary. Thank you, Reverend Chair. A reminder that those who are wishing to remove their names from the second ballot for bishop need to do so by 11 a.m. Likewise, those who wish to provide biographical information should do so by 11 a.m. Voting member registration will close 30 minutes prior to the next business session for the second ballot.
Also, we want to remind everyone that additional nominations to any other position to be elected must be received in the Senate office by noon today. I'm sorry, two, uh, uh, noon, yes, yeah, sorry, you're right, yeah. never mind, noon today, forget that. <laughs> as should all provisions of the constitutional changes to be removed from end block consideration. If you want something pulled out for separate consideration, that also needs to come to the office by noon today. That's, uh, that's where I should have intervened. That's 2 o'clock. Oh, that's the 2 o'clock. En bloc is 2 o'clock so that you can wait till after the workshops, but okay. for the election, it's uh, 11. Okay. And additional nominations, it's 11. Thank you. Sorry about that. A little confusion. We are. This assembly is different because of the additional uh, election. We have to be a little more flexible about the order of business. So um, we're due for a break. We have a scheduled break today. And it, we we're a little bit ahead, five minutes ahead of schedule. So please be back in your seats by 1045. It was intended to be a 15 minute break, but that gives you extra time to get back so that we can start promptly at 1045 again. The assembly is in recess. <laughs>